Well, good morning, church. Um, it is the first Sunday uh, of 2021. As you know, the um, there have been a number of uh, cases of coronavirus that have uh, been discovered and are being tracked and um, the government has enacted some restrictions again. So I do feel that there is um, a great deal of vindication for us in the house church pursuit um, and a great deal of liberty. So I really praise God for that. I want to talk this morning about the purpose in suffering. And uh, this I, I do feel like this is an important message um, specifically considering things like isolation and depression, which have been uh, buzzwords of 2020, and I am quite sure they are going to be buzzwords of 2021. So why don't we open in a word of prayer, and then we'll uh, get straight into our message this morning. Our Father, we thank you this morning and praise you for the, your love and for your grace. Uh, Lord, we uh, lay our lives down into your hands this morning and we entrust ourselves unto you. Father, we praise you for all that you're doing, for we know even in the midst of uh, whatever turmoil there is in the world, you are still in control. And that though the God of this world may have uh, designs and plans against the people of God, Lord, you are our God. You are our shield. You are our portion. You are our deliverer. And we thank you, Father, that our focus is eternal and not temporal. And so help us, Lord, to maintain an, e an eternal focus and not a temporal focus. Because when we do focus on the temporal, on the here and the now, uh, we are subject to all kinds of turmoil, um, both uh, from the world around us and even from within our own hearts. So we praise you and we thank you and we look unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. Amen. Praise the Lord. Well, uh, you could open your Bibles this morning to 2 Corinthians chapter 1. One of the common strategies of the enemy is to induce feelings of isolation in people. And, you know, there's there have been many opportunities for this to happen in the last uh, year. So being isolated, though, is a multifaceted problem because the one who feels isolated may not necessarily be isolated. Um, and people, there are people who are physically isolated who do not feel isolated. Um, so, but the problem is, is that once we develop a feeling of isolation, we often stop seeing the brethren as beloved, uh, we stop seeing them as needed, um, and we stop uh, calling upon them for their help, their love, their support, and to offer our help and love and support. Um, and sometimes we even see them as being the problem because they've they've forgotten about me. They they're allowing this isolation, um, you know, and so we we can project the feelings of isolation onto the nearest uh, as a blame. Uh, you know, can't you see how isolated I am? And now I'm not trying to excuse the body of Christ in its welfare for one another. And there is a fine line here because there are those who need uh, the care of the brethren to to come alongside when they are isolated and, and to stop allowing that isolation to occur. But we can be self-focused in that time if we're the ones being isolated. We can become self-focused and we can become judgmental, pointing our finger at others um, without first going to them with our need. Now, it is a difficult thing because those who attend, you know, those who tend toward Feelings such as isolation or depression seldom reach out to those who may be able to help them. 
And I think this is one of the real strong points of the house church is that we can get to know one another and we can recognize needs and we can build relationships that are, that are built on trust and respect for one another. And in that way, that will allow a, a, um, a development of relationships that allows people the, the feeling of security to be able to approach others. Because it is a, um, uh, I think, a natural tendency to withdraw when we feel isolated and therefore we feel isolated even more. And, um, you know, so the thinking can develop, oh, look how isolated I am. Obviously, people don't love me. So what's the point in reaching out to them because they don't love me anyway? If they loved me, they would know um, what I'm going through. They'd reach out to me, uh, all these kinds of things. And so um, and when we get into that frame of mind, it's very likely that our heart, our thinking will prevent us from reaching out to others and will also then prevent us from serving others and, and reaching out to them both in our need, but in brotherly love to help them. And this will lead to a sinful situation because we are commanded to love one another as Christ loved us. And the feelings of isolation will place people in situations where they're unable to both exercise uh, that love to other people and express the needs that they have to other people so that they can then um, love you in return. So it's, it's obviously a very difficult situation because there are feelings of damage in that circumstance. And um, this is usually the pr precise time when the enemy begins his move. And um, you know, you know the story of the coal that's taken from the fire. The old, um, you know, the the old uh, pastor who goes to visit a member of the congregation who hadn't been at, at uh, you know fellowshipping in some time, and so he goes into the house and they sit by the fire and there's few words being spoken, but the pastor reaches over and grabs the fire poker and he separates a coal out of the fire onto the hearth. And um, uh, the coal goes from that glowing red to black, and then he pushes it back in the fire. And uh, the member of the congregation looks at him and says, you know, um, I, I get the sermon there. I, I, I get the message. So we could kind of summarize at this point and say that problems in, the, in your Christian life are not yours alone. And... Um, you know, that's, that's really important for us that we understand that we're, we are not um, uh, journeying the Christian life alone and in isolation. So uh, Jowett, who is considered one of the greatest preachers in the English-speaking world, and he was one of um, uh, John Newton's um, uh, missionary organization that he developed, CMS, which was Church Missionary Society, it was called. Um, and John Newton, of course, is the um, author of Amazing Grace. Um, Jowett became the first missionary for the CMS to volunteer for overseas missionary service. He said, you seem to imagine that I have no ups and downs, but just a level and lofty stretch of spiritual attainment with unbroken joy and equanimity. By no means. I am often perfectly wretched and everything appears most murky. And I love that quote because it just shows that, um, that people's perception may be entirely the opposite to what is actually happening within a person's life. And uh, it's well recorded that Spurgeon had um, uh, great struggles with depression. He said at one stage, I am the subject of depressions of spirit so fearful that I hope none of you ever get to such extremes of wretchedness as I go to. So, The, the issue is, I guess, we are going to have these struggles in life. 
There's no doubt about that. But God is God despite how I feel. Now, that's easy to say. It's harder to live because we are people subject to our emotions. And the issues of depression, though they might be physiological, at the end of the day, depression and a, and a feeling of isolation, rather than being more a physical issue, and might, might be affected by our, our physical bodies and our physical location, all these kinds of things. But at the same time, there is a great deal of um, mental and, and spiritual warfare, mental warfare at work in this. So 2 Corinthians 1, verse 1, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God and Timothy, our brother, to the church of God, which is at Corinth, with all the saints who are in all Achaia, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort those who are in trouble with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. Now, if you just look at the verses we, we just read, Paul basically says, um, you know, bless God, who is a comfort to us in our tribulation so that we can comfort others who are in trouble because we ourselves understand the comfort we've received from God. Verse 5, For as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, so our consolation also abounds through Christ. Now, if we are afflicted, it is for your consolation and salvation, which is effective for enduring the same sufferings which we also suffer. Or if we are comforted, it is for your consolation and salvation. And our hope for you is steadfast, because we know that as you are partakers of the suffering, so also you will partake of the consolation. So in other words, there is tribulation, and we, are, we understand this, but there's also consolation. And just as we've been through tribulation, and now we're able to comfort you because we've received consolation, you also, in your tribulation, are going to proceed through this and you'll receive consolation and you'll partake of that and you'll be able to help others who are themselves suffering. For we do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, this is verse 8, of our trouble which came to us in Asia, that we were burdened beyond measure above strength so that we despaired even of life. Yes, we had the sentence of death in ourselves that we should not trust in ourselves but in God who raises the dead who delivered us from so great a death and does deliver, deliver us, in whom we trust that he will still deliver us. You're also helping together in prayer for us that many may be given by many persons, uh, that, that thanks may be given by many persons on our behalf for the gift granted to us through many. So no one is immune to trials and tribulations. It's important that we understand this. No one is immune to struggles. And this could include severe struggles such as depression or feelings of isolation. And there are many biblical characters who, who struggled with what would be classified today as depression. Um, depression can be classified simply as a, a low feeling. So Elijah, after the victory at Mount Carmel, became depressed. Moses uh, cried to God, I'm not able to bear all these people. The burden is too great. Kill me. Please kill me. Um, Jonah, Abraham, Job, Jeremiah, uh, and David records very openly uh, his, his struggles are recorded in Scripture for us, and we should take heart because these are people with passions like we. So there are many great biblical characters who struggled with all kinds of things, including depression um, and a sense of a loss of victory and all kinds of things. They went through these things and they found, though ultimately what the Lord was trying to teach them in and through those circumstances. So 
And as a result, they were then transformed and overcame the afflictions that they were facing. So th this is really important for us because many successful men and women in our age in which we live now, these people are also subject to struggle and depression. And we see, we see lots and lots of it in the media today. So we should not be surprised to see Paul in our text here uh, talk about a battle that he was involved in. He says, we were burdened beyond measure, above strength, so that we despaired even of life. So I'm not suggesting that Paul's struggle is necessarily depression, but there is a despair that he speaks of. And, and depression can be a despair of hope. Um, and, you know, it can be tied to that, that when somebody feels that there is no hope, um, it, it doesn't matter about the reality. It, it is a sense of feeling that they have when they feel that there is no hope in their circumstances, uh, that this can lead them into a place where they, where they begin to struggle and feel, uh, begin feeling depressed. So, you know, I, I think there are many believers who will hear what I'm saying and they'll be thinking, you know, oh, depression is about trust, you know, and if somebody's depressed, then they must have hidden sin, so they have to repent. And look, that that there may be some truth to that. Um, in essence, that may be part of the problem, but there could be many other factors, including physical issues. Somebody who was once healthy may have suddenly become unhealthy or injured or disabled and, and really genuinely struggle with the issue of depression. And, and it, you and I should be careful not to make light of that and then say to a person who is struggling, you need to repent because we may add to their feelings then of isolation because internally they may simply be saying, you don't understand what I'm going through. And so getting alongside one another and grieving when they grieve, sorrowing when they sorrow, uh, feeling their pain as much as we can when they're in pain is an important part of our Christian union with one another, of the body's care for one another. And we, we should not be just uh, taking the little snippets of, of uh, cliche quotes from the Word of Faith movement and just saying and, and applying those, you, you know, you, you're lacking faith, brother. It actually may be that they are lacking faith. Don't you believe that God can bring them through that so that they will be able to place their faith in him? That faith is going to be built and established upon the word of God. It is not going to be built and established upon uh, some cliche. So depression cannot just be limited into this kind of category of lack of faith or lack of trust or hidden sin um, when we're discipling someone. So, because there could be many other factors, you know, if, if somebody has lost a life, their, their spouse, a woman has lost her husband or, or been, been um, uh, abandoned by her husband of decades and left to live alone, don't you think that in the early stages, and, and maybe even for a prolonged time, that such a person is going to wrestle with real issues in their life of rejection and of failure and all kinds of things because of many, many reasons. So we should be careful not to limit depression and feelings of despair and isolation into these cliche little statements. Uh, the Christian life is much deeper than that. And in fact, we may simply not know what to say other than to say to such a brother or sister, I, I can't understand exactly what you're going through, but we can go into scripture together and we can pray together that God will give us wisdom and that God will give you hope and that God will help you um, in overcoming the despair that you are facing, right? So Paul's despair was not because of sin. And so we shouldn't assume that all despair, depression, these kinds of things is simply because of sin. At some level, there may be 
uh, sin deep down in the circumstance, you know, and lack of faith and trust. But, it, you know, Paul doesn't describe it that way uh, at all. He says we were burdened beyond measure, above strength, so that we despaired even at life. OK, so that is a fact uh, regarding this issue. No one is immune to um, issues like despair feelings of isolation, uh, feelings of depression, these kinds of things. You're, we're not immune to them. Um, and, and in fact, in almost, I, I, would, I would simply say, through all of those circumstances, God is seeking to build a person's faith and strength in him as an outcome from those circumstances. So, uh, there is a long-term plan and purpose. Now, let's understand, though, this morning, and if you are someone who is facing dis depression or despair or, you know, any such situation, you are not bound to it. It's not something that is to just simply be the hallmark of your life, okay? All the trials we face are appointments God has allowed into our lives, in order to produce his purpose in us. This is really important because the Western church, we, we face trials that the persecuted church does not. And the persecuted church, um, which is probably now welcoming the Western church into their arena of persecution, because in the last uh, eight months, the, the Western church in many countries has faced levels of persecution that we've never experienced before. Um, but generally, our trials differ because God is working in different circumstances. So the persecuted church is outwardly pure in so many ways. And, you know, they have patience and endurance and they rejoice in the sufferings that they face. They have faith that, that God is directing their circumstances and that they, they live in victory despite their circumstances. But there are still the same battles internally. I can promise you that. When we were in Macau, we often went into China and in counseling um, uh, new believers and, and older Christians, they faced the same struggles, or even in just fellowshipping, they faced the same struggles with, with fear and lying and anxiety and lust and all the same uh, issues that you and I face in the Western church. These are common to all of us. The only thing that's different is that they face them in a different, different social context. That's all. So, um, you know, the Western church, I believe has largely been a mess through the 80s and 90s and the noughties, as they call it, the early 2000s uh, or 21st century. And, um, uh, and so there's all been all kinds of sin and, and tolerance of all kinds of behavior, not, not, not just tolerance, but encouraging of all kinds of uh, lax standards and carnality in the church. Um, and, you know, but perhaps one of the biggest challenges to the Western church is that the success we've had as nations, which has brought such levels of comfort and uh, lifestyle. I mean, just, just look at how I'm living here in my living room compared to most of the world, right? And this is by no means luxury in Australia. Um, but compared to the rest of the world, you know, this is luxury. It's, it's crazy. And so, um, you know, the, the church has, has uh, become so entwined with the, the world that we um, have embraced marketing methods of the world. And, uh, you know, we're, we're um, not consulting the word. We consult a church consultant. And um, uh, we, we don't grow in our own, our own personal understanding of finances and biblical behavior regarding finances and investments and different things. Um, we go to professionals for these kinds of things and, um, you know, uh, all that type of stuff. So our, our society 
has created in the background this um, this mega industry mentality. You know, we, we have the medical industry. Um, we have the medical health, a mental health sector, right? Um, we have the pharmaceutical industry, all these kinds of things. Um, and so we've become conditioned to looking, first of all, to a doctor for everything rather than turning to the word, uh, turning to prayer. And so, you know, Christians now go to psychiatrists, uh, psychotherapists, psychologists, psychoanalysts. Um, Christians have become involved in worldly forms of meditation, uh, you know, being in the, in the now meditations, um, kinesiology, Reiki, like these things, yoga, these things stem out of um, uh, very mystical and sinful backgrounds. Um, and, you know, so our thinking has been that if we go and see the professional, and so the Western society has so embraced these Eastern mysticisms now that we see these uh, uh, spiritual practices such as yoga and, and kinesiology and different things like that as being some form of professional service that we should go to rather than, first of all, going to the Lord. So in our text in verse 3, Paul said, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort those who are in trouble. So I want to read this from uh, the NLT. Uh, I think it's good to read various translations, but we should always go for a literal translation. So the NLT is not a literal translation. It, it is a, um, you know, a contextual translation, and they don't always get it right. But listen to what it says here in verse 3 and 4. All praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is our merciful Father and source of all comfort. He comforts us in all our troubles so that we can comfort others. When, we, uh, when they are troubled, we will be able to give them the same comfort God has given us. For the more we suffer for Christ, the more God will shower us with his comfort through Christ. Even when we are weighed down with troubles, it is for your comfort and salvation. So when I'm burdened with troubles, it's for others. When you are burdened with troubles and weighed down with them, it is so that you can experience the grace of God and then be a comfort for others. For when we ourselves are comforted, we will certainly comfort you. Then you can patiently endure the same things we suffer. We are confident that as you share in our sufferings, you also will share in the comfort God gives us. So no one is immune to suffering and no one is bound to exist in suffering and depression. It is, you know, a part of the Christian life. All those who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. So persecution and tribulation and uh, uh, suffering are part of the Christian life and they are not an indication, not an indication of lack of victory, right? That's not to say they're not an area of growth and learning. So let's move quickly on to the finish here this morning. Everyone has something to learn in trials and this is a very important thing. What is the secret of Paul's victory despite his circumstances? Now, there's a question we can discuss at the end. Um, how did Paul endure his sufferings, persecutions, ailments, etc.? Because he had physical ailments that God did not heal him of, right? That's, that's not to say don't pray for, for healing. Paul prayed for healing until God said to him, listen, Paul, I have another plan for you. You're going to go through this. I have another plan for you through this uh, physical ailment that you have. So Paul's secret is no secret at all. It is summarized in a three-letter word, three letters in English, G-O-D, God. So one thing that is usually universal 
about depression and related struggles is that they may not have started because of me. All right, let, just let that sink in. A struggle may not have started because of me, but it continues because of me. Now, I, I don't want to come across as uncaring. Um, I have had struggles. I am, but, the, but what happens is I can take a struggle or a difficulty, an event, a circumstance that I'm experiencing in life, and I can take it from being an event that happens to being a controlling influence. So it can kind of travel with me on the journey of life. So rather than it being a circumstance, um, you know, earlier in 2020, um, you know, I had the, the unfortunate experience of losing my mother. Uh, she passed away, a wonderful mother. She had reached a, a, a phenomenal age at 95. And, you know, I, I can't continue to be self-absorbed in, in that loss. Um, I rejoice in the, the upbringing that I had with such a wonderful lady. And I'm thankful to God. And I, I have prayed that her spiritual circumstances um, were reconciled with God. I had tried to share the gospel with her, and I'm, you know, I can't be certain of those things. I, I don't know the inner workings of her heart. So, but if I take that experience and continue to live in it till now, you know, seven months later, um, I am now becoming self-absorbed in the experience that I had, the event that I had at that time. I'm now embracing that as a way of life. And I am not seeking the Lord concerning his purpose for me now because I'm stuck in that circumstance from back then. Um, so Paul said in verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort. This is a statement of worship. The, Paul is worshipping God in this. All praise to God. Blessed be God, uh, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And this is regardless of circumstances. Paul, and so this is important for us. What am I facing right now? Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of comfort. That, that is a real key to us in my circumstances now. So I'm not saying become callous and, and, and rigidly turn your heart from the experience of suffering because there's something to learn in it. But I am saying that while you're in that suffering, turn your, your attention toward God and worship Him the Father of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort. Worship Him, whether in sickness, whether in financial struggle, psychological turmoil, persecution, grief, sorrow, isolation, mourning, uh, 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 you know, fatigue, all these things, whatever it is that you're facing, praise the Father of your salvation. Praise the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Praise the Father of mercy, all mercies. Praise the God of all comfort. Praise Him. Worship Him. Bless His name. And turn your attention to doing that in prayer because God will help lift you up in your circumstance. So you may still face the struggle that you're going through, but God will lift you up in that, right? So, um, how can we know 
this God of mercy and all comfort? Well, it is by turning our attention to worshipping him in the circumstance we're in, and we will experience his comfort in that time. All right. So unless we face the discomfort, we cannot experience the comfort. I mean, that's true in all of life. I've, I've been hiking and camped on the camp mattress, uh, my, my little air bed that I carried with me. And, you know, when you're carrying um, your hiking, camping gear for 20 kilometer hikes in up and down the, the terrain of Halls Gap, I mean, it's insane terrain. And those difficult circumstances make that mattress feel amazing when you, when you lay down to go to sleep. But when you come home, there's a new level of comfort that you experience again when you don't have to sleep on that mattress and you, you climb into your bed and you're exhausted from days of hiking and, and, uh, and you know, the, the body has been smashed and beaten around and you experience a new level of comfort because of the discomfort you're in. So it's the same in your life. Um, you know, you are going to face struggle, struggles and, and challenges and discomfort. Worship the God of our text. 2 Corinthians 1 verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort. So turn to him in that struggle with a statement of worship. I worship you. God and Father of the, the Lord of my salvation, Jesus Christ. I worship you. You're the Father of mercies. I need your mercy now. You are the God of all comfort. I need your comfort now. Scripture is true. You will experience God's comfort as you turn your heart in worship to him through your circumstance. Okay, so... Uh, time's not really going to allow any further, but, um, you know, I, I wonder what, um, ha have you, have you been in those circumstances where you, um, have struggled to find the experience of God's mercy and God's comfort? Um, you know, what kind of circumstances might cause that? Um, and, have you been in those circumstances and experienced God's mercy and comfort? And, and would you like to share that uh, this morning with one another? And let's, let's go back to that previous question. What is the secret of Paul's victory despite the circumstances? Let's, let's talk about that. And uh, maybe there are some other texts that you would like to share because there are many, uh, especially in Paul's writings, there are many texts in which he talks about uh, God and God's uh, beautiful strength and, and, and um, supply in the midst of the circumstances Paul was facing. God bless you. Enjoy the fellowship together today.